Well, welcome to St. Peter's Online. We're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Xavier, and whether you know Jesus or not, or whether you're just here investigating things or interested, warm welcome to you. In a moment, you will hear the Bible read and then explain. We firmly believe here at St. Peter's that God speaks to us today through His life-giving Word. And my prayer is this will help you to know Him or to know Him better. Enjoy following along. We invite up Joanna and Rob. Today's reading comes from Jonah chapter 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath me barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you in your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. Here in Surrey. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11, the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am, starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. 
So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Hi everyone, good to see you all. My name's Angus. Can I just grab the clicker from one of the singers? It's up here. I got it, don't worry. <laughs> got a few slides, not many, that's okay. Um, great to see you all. As I said, my name's Angus, I'm on staff here at St. Peter's. Uh, a big welcome to church, great to see the regulars and if you're new or visiting, great to see you as well. Uh, I hope you enjoy your, your time here as we gather around God's word and hear from him and listen to him and respond to him. Um, digging into this passage in Jonah, we're going to be looking at some fairly big and serious topics today. We're going to be thinking fairly black and white about some things, um, some ideas that come up in our passage, and that's going, to, that's going to push us to think that way, fairly black and white kind of way. So how about I pray that God will help us understand His Word and help our hearts receive His Word today. Now, Father, we give you great thanks uh, for your prophet Jonah. Thank you that by his actions, he points us to the Lord Jesus. Father, we ask today that we will be receptive to your word. Give us hearts that understand and, and receive um, this uh, wonderful prayer of Jonah's that points us to the life that we can have with you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, is anybody much of a fisherman or fisherwoman? No. Hardly anyone. Daryl, <laughs> that's good, and Pete, <laughs> and Kevin, <laughs> and Andrew. Okay, there's some. I'm not much of a fisherman. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not much of a fisherman. I've got an old broken rod down in the back of my shed, a box of old plastic lures that are terrible at catching fish. You can probably count on, on, my, on one hand how many fish, fish I've actually caught. But I still remember my first fish. It was up at Caloundra in Queensland and cast out, waited for ages, and then it was little puffer fish. And we had to carefully throw it back in. <laughs> I mean, some of you, I mean, some of you like fishing, some of you. Will, our year 13 trainee, he loves fishing. He, he always tells us about his fishing adventures. He loves fishing with his, with his mates. I think I'm not patient enough for fishing. I don't know about you, what your problem is with fishing, but I like to blame the fish though instead of my patience. The fish is fault, they're not jumping on the lures. Uh, Will's caught some pretty big fish though. I don't know how big the, the five fishermen have caught how big you've caught, but Will, I think he's caught some pretty big fish. Uh, I hear that there's a trick when you take a photo as to, as to how to show off how big the fish is, and you can kind of show it off that it's actually a little bit bigger than it actually is if you, you hold it out closer to, yeah, Pete's got it, Pete's done it before, haven't you? <laughs> you hold it out close to the camera, the fish looks a lot bigger than it actually is. But when the fish start getting really big, really impressive, you can't actually hold them out here, they're too heavy, aren't they? You have to hold them, you actually have to hold them out your chest, and wow, that's an, that's an impressive one. But the fish in Jonah, I mean, there's no way you could pick up that fish, right? A fish big enough, a whale big enough to swallow a person. I mean, last week, if you were here, I spoke very briefly about the fish, the fish in Jonah. And even though the, you know, the, fish, the concept of a fish swallowing a man or, and the man surviving the fish and being spat back out, that concept kind of jumps out of the page to us, doesn't it? We're, kind of, we're, we're gripped by that. Or, um, or, or in, in the kids' books, they like to make such a big deal of the fish the, it, it makes a great story, this big fish in Jonah. But I think if you and I, if we pay close attention to the text before us, I think we find that the fish is actually fairly passive. It's not really a, about the fish. The fish is what's controlled by God. It doesn't get much of a mention. It's more about what the fish actually resembles and does than the fact that this kind of fish exists. It's more of a byproduct of the story. The fish isn't the point. The fish isn't the point. The point is... Jonah, and how he could possibly be saved from death. Last week, we saw that there's no escape from God, that he's the God of all, that Jesus is reigning over all, and that every knee will bow to him. And today, as we enter this, the center of the book, we're going to see that God's mercy is truly boundless, that he truly is the God of all, and, 
that only he can save, that only he can bring salvation to there. So as we're going through this little chapter, we're going to ask for you and me, how can, how can we possibly have life with God? Is there anything that I can do to be saved? How can I be forgiven by God? How can I find salvation? And just a heads up, I'm going to ask you a bit later. I'm going to ask you later, where do you stand with God? Do you have life? I'm going to ask you that question a bit later, so keep an ear out for it. So let's get stuck in, the depths of death. Let's, uh, hopefully you've got a Bible that you can look into. We've, we're looking at the first five verses now. Let's read those first five verses again. Look down with me from verse 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. We're reading Jonah's prayer from inside the belly of the fish. We're reminded here that Jonah's, he has, he's been cast overboard. He was on the boat with the sailors heading across the Mediterranean, but he's, he said, throw me overboard because he knew that there was no escape from God. He was fleeing from God and he knew that there was no escape. The only thing was to throw him overboard. And so here he's been thrown over the board, overboard. He's swirling around the water. He's drowning. He's as good as dead. How on earth could he be saved from that? Jonah uses these rich metaphors and poetic language to stir in you and I, the readers, the same kind of feelings and um, an emotional response to, to the experience. He's hurled into the depths, the very heart of the seas. Waves swept over me. And we've got to ask, where will this salvation come from? But more, th- more than that, did you see how he talks about his physical experience in spiritual terms? Look again at verse 4 with me. He he says, I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The way he's being engulfed by the waters is symbolic of his relationship with God. He frames his experience in the water in terms of God's judgment, but he gives a glimmer of hope in this little verse. He's saying that in the midst of physical judgment, of being cast overboard, that's actually connected to God's judgment upon him. Because it is, isn't it? He's, he's rebelled against God by attempting to flee across the Mediterranean and do the opposite of what God asked him to do. And so God's justice is coming to bear upon Jonah. Now I think for, to, to, for us to feel that weight of judgment, let's just sit with the language for a second. He, he says, the, the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. Where can he look to be saved? I'm not sure if you're keeping up with it, but a lot of the world was on pause a couple of weeks ago uh, as a lost submarine was being searched for. Did you see that in the news? It was a submarine heading for the Titanic, a number of people on board, and they lost communication with it. So they spent about a week trying to search for it. They were traveling into the depths of the ocean in this submarine. The deep was surrounding them. You might have heard that it actually it, it imploded under the pressure of deep water. That's why they lost communication with it. It imploded. There was an issue with the construction. It couldn't hold up under the power of the sea. The people on board were killed instantly, literally instantly. It was that fast. A terrible tragedy, isn't it? Death is always terrible. I wonder if, if you ever come close to drowning before. Have you ever come close to drowning? Pete has. <laughs> I have. I have, a, I have a friend who's a missionary in Indonesia. And she's told me a story that when she was a little girl, she was out playing by the family pool and she fell into the water. And she was lying there face down in the water for quite a long time. Her dad rushed out and found her there. It was quite scary. Really scary for her. She, he, he got her out of the pool. He rushed her to the hospital. They didn't know which way she would go, whether she would live or die. It was quite, uh, quite scary. 
Um, as I said, she's a, she's a missionary, missionary now, so she's, she survived by God's grace. She survived. She overcame the impact that that had on her body and her, her brain. And she's over in Indonesia proclaiming that Jesus is Lord of all. She recognized who her Lord and Savior was. The point is, water is dangerous and deadly. And that's the point Jonah is making in chapter 2. In the sea, Jonah was as good as dead. In the depths of the Mediterranean, he was dead. And his, his prayer tells us that he knew that. It's, it's not just in the water, it's while he's in the smelly belly of the fish as well, isn't it? He, he doesn't know what's going to happen to him, even in the belly of the fish. Is he just going to be digested? He knows he's as good as dead. But it's from the belly of the fish that he's able to cry out to the Lord. He can cry out to the Lord. I know, um, I know some of us here at St. Peter's have faced some tragic deaths that family members, loved ones. Some of us have, have faced the death of, of family, family members or dear friends. Some of us might even be sitting with a diagnosis that gives us a date. But it's, it's really important for all of us to engage with death. No matter how close or far it is from us, it's important to think about death. Because it's something that does come for us all, doesn't it? It comes for us all. When we're confronted with death, it should make us realise our own mortality. We who are living will die one day. That one day, our death will be the death that others are grieving. But it's not just the day that we die that we're dead. Let me say that again. It's not just the day we die when we're dead. See, Ephesians 2 says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. That is to say, all of us who live, if if it weren't for Jesus, we're dead people walking. Ephesians says that in our rebellion against God, we are dead, as good as dead, even though we're walking, we're talking, we're as we're as good as dead in our rebellion against God. An analogy here is like we're cut flowers. You know cut flowers? You cut them off from the source of life, you stick them in your living room, they look beautiful, don't they? But what happens? They die because they've been cut from their source of life. Some of us might look like beautiful peonies, some of us like daffodils, some of us like maybe just a standard dandelion, but you cut off from the source of life and they're dead even though they look alive for a time. And that's, that's the state we find ourselves in with God. When we run away from Him, we cut ourselves off from the author of life. We're as good as dead. And the problem with being dead is that there's nothing that we can do about it. We're helpless, aren't we, in the state of deadness. We, we can do nothing to bring about salvation to ourselves. And think, it's the same story for Jonah so far, isn't it? For, for three days in the belly of the fish... He would be truly dead unless the Lord hadn't helped him. There was nothing he could do in the middle of the Mediterranean because the Lord helped him though. And it's from the belly of the fish that Jonah can see the light of salvation. The light of salvation. So let's keep reading to see what he can see. From verse 6, let's hear about Jonah's only hope in the face of his own death. Read along with me. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Here we have hope, don't we? We have hope in the face of death. Verse 9, salvation comes from the Lord. I think that verse there is the theological centre of the book of Jonah. That is to say, Jonah is speaking a deep truth here when he says salvation comes from the Lord. Despite his own rebellious actions, And we're going to see next week, despite his arrogance, 
this truth rings out throughout the book of Jonah. Salvation comes from the Lord. It's in spite of what Jonah does that God brings salvation. Because salvation belongs to the Lord and the Lord only. This wonderful little book presents us with Jonah and the judgment fallen upon him. It presents us with the wickedness of Nineveh that is spoken of in chapter 1 and we'll see more of next week and God's judgments that's going to fall upon them. But this book shows us that salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation from that judgment, from death. It shows us that as Jonah is rescued, the Lord commanded the fish and it spat Jonah onto dry land. He is saved. And we'll see it next week once Jonah travels to Nineveh. He announces the coming judgment to the Ninevites and their actions of the Ninevites show us that they also know that salvation comes from the Lord and the Lord alone. Did you notice that there in verse 8? In Jonah's prayer, verse 8, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Salvation comes from the Lord and only the Lord, not from worthless idols. And it cannot come from dead people walking. Jonah can't save himself. The Ninevites can't save themselves. You and I can't save ourselves in our state of deadness. This book, and particularly this chapter here in the centre, is to show us the movement from death to life. And that that salvation from death to life can only come from the Lord. And we're shown it by Jonah's experience, aren't we? I put a quote in last week's bulletin from the church father, Augustine, that picks up on this. I don't know how much Augustine you've read. Probably not much. But here's a little quote from Augustine from the 4th century. He says, The prophet Jonah not so much by speech as by his own painful experience, prophesied Christ's death and resurrection much more clearly than if he had proclaimed them with his voice. But why was he taken into the whale's belly and restored on the third day, but that he might be a sign that Christ should return from the depths of hell on the third day? Not so much by speech as by his own painful experience. Jonah was a thoroughly insufficient prophet, wasn't he? What he it was in, in what he was supposed to do. But God gave him this experience with the fish and we have it recorded here for us to demonstrate to us the good news of the gospel that moves us from death to life. That is, Jonah's experience is a signpost of things to come in the future of Israel. An experience that happened in the 8th century BC that points us forward to the 1st century and the events of the gospel. Where the Lord Jesus died, he was buried for three days, just like Jonah in the belly of the fish, and then rose to life. Uh, Jesus speaking in Matthew 12 picks up on that idea, and we'll, we'll read Luke's account of the same teaching of Jesus next week. The point is, the point is, Jonah's salvation from death can only come from the Lord. And in God's sovereign plans and purposes, this salvation for Jonah points to Jesus who died the death you and I deserve, he took upon himself our punishment. Instead of us having to face our own drowning at sea, he became sin for us. In our place, Jesus faced God's judgment. And in his rising from the dead, God vindicated the Lord Jesus as the one true king, the one true prophet, the Lord of all. Jesus is God's chosen king and his resurrection shows us that. It shows us that Jesus is God's king of his eternal kingdom. And that because Jesus has been raised, the light of life is on offer to us here today because death has been defeated. We can receive God's boundless mercy, not, not by anything that we can do. Remember, we're, we're dead in our sin. But God has made us alive in Christ. The next part of that Ephesians passage says this, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. The thing is, we all face the depths of death because of our rebellion against God. We all face that. But the light of salvation is on offer to all who turn and trust in the Lord Jesus. Not by my work, 
not by my power or my might, because salvation comes from the Lord and the Lord alone. I think here there's a, there's a few different points of application for us here today that we could think about. But I actually think we, we, need, we, we really need to drill down and focus on the main point here, that salvation comes from the Lord. I said at the start we're going to be thinking about things fairly black and white, and we, we have been. Death and life, it is a fairly black and white thing. But at this point, as I said, I'm going to ask you, no, no matter how long you've been coming to church, no matter whether you've been baptised or confirmed or, or neither, no matter your background, your family's religion, no matter your age, no matter your understanding of the Bible, I need to ask you, are you dead or alive? Have you received God's boundless mercy in Christ and so have been made alive? Or are you still trapped in your sin? Dead. Do you need to do business with God today? No one else can offer you this salvation. Nothing can. Not money or wealth, not positive psychology, not the government, not Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism, nor any other religion, nor the church, nor clergy, not positive experience or somehow feeling the presence of God in a, in a building somewhere. No one else can offer you this salvation. Nothing can. Because salvation comes from the Lord and the Lord alone. So I just want us to take a minute now, a moment to, to sit and to think about where, where we all stand with God. Are you still trapped in sin, facing your own death on your own? Let's take a moment to consider that and then we're going to pray this prayer on the screen. It's a prayer that can bring you from death to life. Let's take a moment to think about where you stand with God. There's nothing special about this prayer. It's not these particular words written this way that will save you. This prayer is an acknowledgement that only God can save. And so if you're realising today that you are dead, you are drowning at sea, these words are for you to pray to come back to God, to receive life. But if you have received life, these are good words for you to pray as well, to be reminded and encouraged and exhorted to remain in the faith that you have. Would you pray these words with me? In the quietness of your hearts. Dear God, I know I am drowning in death because I have rebelled against you. I am sorry for running away from you. Please forgive me. Thank you that salvation can only come from you. Please save me. Help me now to live a life that brings you honour. Amen. I just want to say, if you prayed that prayer, you can know for certain that God has truly forgiven you in the Lord Jesus, that He has welcomed you into His family, that He loves you, that you have moved from death to life. Hear these words from Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you prayed that prayer, can I say, you need to let us know. You can let us know on the, on the QR code that Grant's going to talk about a bit later. Uh, and you can... Can you, you can tell someone here today as well that you, you might have prayed that prayer because the thing is, salvation comes from the Lord and the Lord alone. Amen. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, here at St Peter's, we consider ourselves to be God's dearly loved children. We're passionate for Him and we desire for everyone to know Jesus and to grow in Him. And we have so many activities around that for toddlers, children, youth, uh, young adults, adults and more. Feel free to drop in anytime at one of our gatherings at 8am, it's kind of more traditional service, 10am or 4pm we have children's programs or 6pm in the evening that's followed by dinner. 
you'd be more than welcome. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, we'd love to help you. We do a series called Hope, and you can meet new people. Or if you'd like to join St. Peter's, uh, we have a special series called Belong, which can help you find your feet. So let us know. You can text us on 0466 200 791. I'll repeat that for our radio listeners, 0466 200 791. Or you can use the QR code, which we'll leave up for the next minute or so. Enjoy your week.